Magneto was right. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in X-Men 97 Episode 8, Tolerance is Extinction Part 1. So the title is a combination of a couple of different important X-Men crossovers. First, it's taken from the Extinction Agenda, when the X-Men liberated mutant slaves on Genosha, but it's a more direct adaptation of Operation Zero Tolerance, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. But the episode title was hinted at all the way back in Episode 1 this season, when Gyrick said, Tolerance is extinction. Now, when Gyrick said that, he meant that if humans tolerate mutants, they would become extinct. But now, Magneto could see it the other way. If mutants tolerate humanity, then humanity will wipe them out. So, we had a lot of big reveals this episode, like the origin of Bastion. Yeah, what's up with that? Well, don't worry. A little later, I'm going to explain exactly where Bastion came from in the original series and the comics that this show is adapting. But first, I want to thank all of you for watching and for supporting us and for shopping at our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com, where we design all the merch ourselves. I am very excited to announce these brand new shirts for May. We have this awesome Doug is Cyclops shirt, Morphs from X-Men and Treasure Planet, and this new X-Men is the Cast of Friends parody shirt in all its 90s glory. I'm in the 90s! This is on top of all the other great X-Men inspired merch, like the x Club Breakfast Club parody, the parody of Nighthawks, and of course the Gambit tribute, Remember It. Not to mention Deadpool and Wolverine parody merch like LFG, Can You Show Me How to Get to the MCU, and the MCU Savior. The links for all of those are below. Thank you so much for watching. So, Doug, you asked about Bastion's origin. In the opening credits, we do see flashes of Storm and Wolverine fighting Nimrod from the episode One Man's Worth. And this is actually the episode with Bastion's origin. So here's what happened. So in Bishop's future, Master Mold sent Nimrod and a mutant called Fitzroy back in time to assassinate college age Professor Xavier. And get this, they succeeded. This altered the present day, showing us an alternate timeline where Magneto leads mutants in a war against superheroes and humanity. So then Bishop, with the help of alternate timeline Storm and Wolverine, traveled back in time again to prevent the assassination. So when they do save Xavier's life, they fight Nimrod, the super advanced sentinel from Bishop's future. Now Nimrod can reform itself, take on the form of humans, and it's basically indestructible. The only way they're ever able to destroy Nimrod is by disabling its time band and sending it back to the future. So in this episode though, we thought that Nimrod was destroyed, but it turns out that it survived and then he possessed or replaced a janitor at the school. And then that janitor went on to Father Bastion. And as we'll talk about later, Bastion has been lurking behind behind the scenes and appearing in every episode of this show. The other major changes in the opening credits are the return of Professor Xavier and this inclusion of Magneto on Asteroid M. What's, what's, ast what's Asteroid ast What is that? So Asteroid M was Magneto's headquarters in some of the earliest X-Men comics. It appeared in the animated series in the Great Two-Parter Sanctuary. In those episodes, Magneto builds the asteroid as a mutant haven and says that he just wants humans to leave mutants alone. So he invites every mutant on Earth to come and live with him. Where any mutant may live apart from humanity, free from its cruelty. And in the process, he liberated the mutant slave state of Genosha. Long story short, one of his new acolytes betrays him and takes his place, and then this guy tries to start an all-out nuclear war with the flat scans. You will serve our cause much better. As a martyr. Magneto saves the Earth, but he loses his mutant sanctuary. And the next couple times we see him in the show, he's all mopey and depressed. Losing Asteroid M has made me weary of this life. But those events led him to try another way, Xavier's dream. But I think that's pretty much over with now. Hey, what's up, Hepcats? Any of you fellow kids want a TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, what are you wearing? No, Give no, no, me uh -oh. that. Well, as you can see, I'm not a young person. I'm bald. Bald! Bald! My guy, you are not bald, you are just losing your hair. And if your hair is thinning, guys, you don't have to worry. You can actually do something about it with Keeps. They're the sponsor of this video. You will not believe how many guys start losing their hair, but they put off doing something about it. Wow, does Keeps actually work? Yes, I have been using Keeps for years. And if it weren't for Keeps, I would have lost my hair a long time ago. Wow, so you really use Keeps. I sure do. And what I like most about Keeps is that it's convenient, delivered straight to my front door, and I don't have to go through the hassle of making appointments and waiting in line at an office. I get a personalized plan from a licensed medical provider without leaving my home. I can even message this medical provider at any time via their secure messaging portal. Keeps offers both of the FDA approved hair loss treatment options as well as a two-in-one treatment that combines both treatments. In fact, most Keeps customers see results within six months of starting their treatment. So it is important to act fast and you have to start early and stick with it. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. Keeps stopped my hair loss right in its tracks and they have helped over one million men like us with only science 
fact ingredients. That's why Keeps has more than 5,000 five-star reviews. So if you're noticing that you're losing your hair, don't ignore it or hope it goes away. Do something about it right now because hair loss stops with Keeps. Thanks again to Keeps for sponsoring this video and for the free product. So for a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash screen crush or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash screen crush. Now back to what I was saying. So the episode begins dealing with the fallout of the Cable is Nathan reveal from last episode. Gene says that Bishop and Nate were separated in the time stream, which resulted in Cable going a thousand years into the future, the future ruled by Apocalypse that we saw in the original show. But wait a minute, if Apocalypse rules Cable's future, then how does Bastion make mutant extent. These timelines are so confusing. Well, you're, you're right, that is confusing, but the thing to remember about the X-Men universe is that the time stream is very malleable and it's always changing because of time travel. Like in that episode I mentioned, One Man's Worth, we actually see the ripple effect of Xavier's assassination go through the time stream and change the present day. Are you okay, darling? What was that? So, I think that because Nimrod was from the future, we are seeing Bastion actually rewrite the time stream. So, Cable's future is slowly being erased because of this time travel sentinel. We also saw Cable's future being erased by time travel in season two, and that erasure took the form of a whirling vortex. Now, I wanna talk about Bastion in the comics, and I also wanna to touch on a few Easter eggs that a lot of people, including us, missed so far this season. Now, we spotted Bastion way back in episode four in this photo, but at the time, I thought this was just like an Easter egg, like how the original series had all sorts of mutants pop in and out. So I never really took the time in that video to explain in depth who he is. So it all started with the seminal X-Men two-parter Days of Future Past. As Douglas Wolk wrote in his book, All the Marvels, the two most important X-Men stories are Days of Future Past and the Dark Phoenix Saga. The former shows the consequences of the X-Men's failure and the latter shows what happens when the X-Men lose control of their powers. Days of Future Past shows an apocalyptic future where mutants are exterminated by Sentinels. And actually, the X-Men comics revisited this reality at least twice during the Chris Claremont run. The first is the famous comic where Wolverine stands in front of the poster, but in the other, Scott and Jean's future daughter, Rachel Summers, travels back in time and becomes an X-Man. She is pursued by a super advanced sentinel named Nimrod, who we have seen several times in the original show. In the comics, Nimrod was also created to be able to take on human form, and he replaces a man in the modern day called Nicholas Hunter, and then he becomes a crime fighter. Long story short, the X-Men are fighting Nimrod when a buried master mold comes out of the ground. Then then Rogue punches both of them through a portal called the Siege Perilous. Now, the Siege Perilous is taken from Arthurian lore. It's the empty seat at the round table reserved for any knight who found the Holy Grail. But in the X-Men comics, it's a portal that it's a gateway to the multiverse and it essentially grants you a second chance at life. For instance, Colossus enters the Siege Perilous and is granted a happy life of an artist with a model girlfriend. Oh, so it was an easy way for Chris Claremont to write characters off the comic. Yeah, exactly. But in the comics, the Siege Perilous combined Nimrod and Master Mold into an amnesiac human-like being. He was found by a nice woman named Anne Gilberti who named him Bastion. So Bastion slowly regains his memories and he remembers his mission to destroy all mutants. So in the comics, this comes right after a major event called Onslaught, where the minds of Professor Xavier and Magneto forge into one being that almost kills like, like every superhero. In fact, lots of heroes were presumed dead for a while after this event. Following Onslaught, Bastion went to the government and said, I can give you protection from mutants. So the governments of the world authorized Operation Zero Tolerance, where Bastion and turned regular humans into prime sentinels, just like we see in the show. Except in the show, we didn't have like an onslaught event. But I think that following the mutant uprising in the series finale, Bastion used the human's fear of mutants to get their permission to begin Operation Zero Tolerance. And remember, those riots from the series finale were kicked off by Gyrick assassinating Xavier. And Gyrick was most likely acting on orders from Bastion. So Bastion is kind of like Palpatine. He's been manipulating these events for years so he could rise to power. Power. Now, on rewatching these seasons, we can see Bastion foreshadowed several times. In our first episode breakdown, I pointed out how the Friends of Humanity using arm cannons showed how they were becoming more machine-like and sacrificing their own humanity. It turns out that was also foreshadowing the prime sentinels that Bastion and Sinister are creating. And now I want to run through a few more foreshadowing and a few of those Easter eggs we missed. For one, an astute viewer named Anthony Pierce let me know that Beast's font in the opening title is taken from a brief run he had in the comic Amazing Adventures. This is the story where he turned himself blue and fuzzy. Val Cooper is introduced running on a treadmill, just like the president was in the original X-Men pilot. When Madeline gets her first vision of Genosha, she senses someone else, right when we see a child collaring a burning building that looks like the X-Mansion. And of course, later on, we see this same drawing in Bastion's childhood home. X-Men 97 executive producer Bo DeMaio hinted that Bastion has appeared or been mentioned in every episode this season, and this is his first appearance. And later, Master Mold says, You underestimate us. 
but who is the us? It's Bastion and Sinister. In episode two, Scott's visor becomes cracked in a very similar way to Cable's eye scar, except it's on the opposite side of his face. But I do think this foreshadows that Cable is his son from the future. I actually noticed that in episode two, but I didn't want to like spoil anything for anyone. Also, we see this clip of military leaders at a table meant to mimic the war room of Dr. Strangelove. But right there, that's Bastion sitting at the table with the elite and powerful. It's also interesting that Madeline shows Gambit a vision of the clothes that Rogue wore when she was in the Savage Land with Magneto, even though Madeline was not there for those events. Might be something to flag later, or it might just be a design choice they made. In episode three, Master Mold was in one of the visions that Madeline showed the team, which is also kind of another Bastion cameo. Sinister also says, If only Xavier's orphans knew the future we have in store for them. Again, here, he's implying Bastion. And notice how as soon as Wolverine brings Jean back, she pulls her hair back into a ponytail. So this makes me think that the Jean in the original series was always the real Jean because she always wore a ponytail. In episode four, new rock stars caught this long shot doll that we missed, great catch guys, and older Jubilee cautions her younger self to not get lost in nostalgia because the world is about to change. It always stays the same, but that's not living. Life's a total risk and it's on you. In hindsight, this was Bo DeMaio talking to the audience proxy, Jubilee, preparing all of us for the apocalyptic events of Genosha. Also, early in Storm storyline, we can see the eyes of the adversary doll watching Forge and Storm right here. I also want to shout out the hard R superstar on Twitter for pointing out the horse people in episode 6 are actually Chimelians, the horse people from the Power Pack. And in episode 7, Cap Shield makes the same sound it does in the MCU. When Jean and Scott move this rock, they react to the smell of dead bodies. <sighs> And Bastion is introduced surrounded by screens, just like he is in the Zero Tolerance comics. Back to the episode. Cable spells out Bastion's plan, which is just like in the Zero Tolerance comics, to upgrade humans into living machines that eradicate mutants. In his new utopia, we see Moscow upgraded to a kind of Art Deco future, and we also see the Sentinels forcing mutants to rebuild the Golden Gate Bridge, maybe because it's always getting destroyed in movies, including in X3. But the mutant rebuilding the bridge looks a lot like the aforementioned Rachel Summers, Scott and Jean's daughter from the future. The markings on her face were tattoos given to mutants called the Hounds. These were people who were forced to use their telepathic abilities to hunt down their fellow mutants. And this woman with the green hair is probably Polaris, a member of X Factor that we saw in the episode Cold Comfort. Notice how Cable's timeline diagram kind of looks like the TVA's sacred timeline, with these branches coming off of a wavy line. And we also see key events in the timeline. This one shows Magneto's helmet, probably him joining the X-Men. And this shows Marvel Girl's mask by some DNA strands, probably the creation of Madeline Pryor. And then Beast says, The mystics of Kamartage speak of absolute points, events that occur across all timelines. And I know all you guys caught that one. Kamartage is obviously the place where the ancient one trained Stephen Strange. And in the show What If, there is an incredible episode about an alternate universe Stephen Strange trying to save the life of his Christine. The ancient one tells him, Her death is an absolute point in time. Absolute. Unchangeable. Unmovable. Now, I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it's a great episode, and it shows how you cannot reverse an absolute point in time. And I, for one, am so glad that this show cannot reverse Genosha. It means that these events will have lasting consequences and that Gambit's sacrifice won't be diminished. And then, on the TV, we see that Bastion has leaked the footage of Xavier being alive, and he also frames the X-Men for Gyrick's murder, causing Wolverine to go all Elvis on the TV. Remember, Gyrick's attempted assassination of the Professor at the end of the original series sparked mutant riots and uprisings, but it also led to a great deal of mutant sympathy. So Gyrick acting alone actually worked against Bastion's plan. Like when our village idiot Gyrick made a martyr of Xavier and and then we see William Stryker on TV calling for all-out war against mutants. Now, Stryker was portrayed by Brian Cox in X2, then by Danny Houston in X-Men Origins Wolverine, and finally by Sean William Scott in Days of the Future Past. No, 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 that was Josh Hellman. No, man, Sean William Scott played Stryker in Days of the Future Past. No, he didn't, and it's Days of Future Past. There's no that. No, did you? Actually, you're right. I have had that wrong for years, and I'm really sorry. I just, I just need one moment for my brain to readjust. Dust in the wind. Anyways, in the movie, Stryker is a military leader, but in the show, he appears to be a fanatical preacher, like he is in the excellent graphic novel God Loves, Man Kills by Chris Claremont and Brent Anderson. This is an amazing story, and it's the basis for the movie X2. Then Nightcrawler helps Jean reconcile with having shared memories with Madeline. He tells her about his own life experience. I was abandoned by my mother Mystique as an infant. Then, I met Rogue years later. We chose not to abandon each other, and simply 
be family. Now, he is referring to the events of the episode Bloodlines. In that episode, we not only learn that Mystique is Nightcrawler's mom who abandoned him, and that Rogue is his adopted sister, but we also learn that Sabretooth is Nightcrawler's stepdad. Finally, he tells her, Family is a choice. And that's essentially what X-Men is. It's a story about found families. Scott and Jean track down Bastion's origin to a real town called Harmony, Pennsylvania. But I think the name here is mostly used to be symbolic about how he is trying to bring harmony to the human race by turning them all into murder bots. At Bastion's lair, check this out. Sinister turns around. <laughs> What's the big deal about that? Well, in the original series, Sinister Suit was very hard to animate, so they deliberately never had him pivot. He's mostly just seen from one angle all the time. And then we learned that Val Cooper was indeed working with Bastion, but she didn't know about Genosha. So that means that Bastion used her to arrest Magneto in episode two. I didn't know, I swear, I'm sorry. But it also means that he not only attacked Genosha, but he was probably also responsible for the UN's decision to admit Genosha as a member of the UN. In other words, he set up this mutant nation just so it would be attacked. He's been behind everything right from the start. Cooper compares Sinister to Joseph Mengele, the Nazi torturer and piece of shit eugenicist who used Jewish prisoners as genetic fodder. I knew Mengele. Now Sinister knew Mengele because He's actually 200 years old. In the episode Descent, we see his origin, that he was a scientist obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution, but he wanted to propel humanity forward by conducting his own experiments on mutants and making himself immortal in the process. And he says, Pink pens brimming with mutant test subjects. That's my. And this desire goes all the way back to that episode when we see Charles Xavier's ancestor free Sinister's prisoners from their cells. My work, my subjects, my children. So Bastion has Magneto tied to a cross shaped like an X, similar to the cross that the Reavers tie Wolverine to in the Australian Outback, which we see in this iconic cover of Uncanny X-Men 251 by Mark Silvestri. Now the subtext here is that Magneto is a martyr, like Christ. And to really hit home that he is the righteous victim, we finally see his Holocaust tattoo. The original series had to tip toe around specifics of his past, showing soldiers in German-like uniforms attacking young Magneto, but never outright saying that he was the victim of the Holocaust. Now, I'm really glad, though, that this show is doubling down, showing the end result of bigotry in our own world. I mean, look, when he tells Leech not to be afraid in German, Hab keine Angst. <laughs> That still gets me because it echoes with so much real world pain. So the Summers family goes to Bastion's childhood home where we see that he has always had an interest in robots. Right here, this is a program from the Stark Expo. In the MCU, this was a kind of continuation of the World's Fair that we saw in First Avenger, but Howard Stark reinvented it to be an annual celebration of science. And it was also a map of a new element to save Tony Stark's life. A new element that, in the novelization, is called Vibranium. Tony restarts the Expo in Iron Man 2. But we also see a toy robot that looks a lot like the Sentinels. Now, just like in Operation Zero Tolerance, we meet his mother, Rose, and his father looks a lot like Nicholas Hunter, the person that Nimrod replaced in the comics. So when Jean gets this telepathic echo, we hear Master Mold say, You should be the most powerful alive. And this is what Master Mold said to Fitzroy in the alternate future we saw in One Man's Worth Part 2. You shall be the most powerful mutant alive. Just before he sent this Nimrod Sentinel back in time. We also see the overlay of Nimrod's face on this origin story, just like we saw it on Rogue's face when she touched Gyrick's mind. I still think she might be infected with nano sentinels that made her drop Trask off the building, but I guess we'll find out in a future episode when she finally wakes up. On his wall of drawings, we can also see a couple images of Master Mold, drawings of the utopia that he envisions, and this one looks like Cable speaking to his mother Rose, which means that he predicted everything that's about to happen. Very creepy. All of this is going back to what Gyrick said. Just as you dreamt it. Back at Bastion's headquarters, this bald woman with him is probably Daria. Now, in the comics, she was this young woman who worked for him, and she had sympathy toward Jubilee. In fact, she helped Jubilee escape after Jubilee helped her realize that Bastion had infected her with Nano Sentinels. So Bastion is having a teleconference with other supervillains. Now, that's going to remind a lot of you of the World Security Council we saw in the Avengers. But for me, this kind of thing's always going to remind me of the Council of Thirteen and the Venture Brothers. Councilman Three got Adobe Premiere. Was it too showy? I thought it would make the scene more lively. We see him talk to my all-time favorite villain, Doctor Doom. And get this, guys. Apart from this Secret Wars comic and the Deadpool trailer, this is the first official appearance of Doctor Doom in the MCU. <laughs>
Except I actually think this is a Doom bot, but whatever. But even Doom is not on board with genocide. Do not mistake Doom's collusion as indifference to flagrant war crimes. This is because as a child, Doom is actually subjected to similar persecution as Magneto. His people were Romani travelers who were persecuted by a local Baron. And speaking of Baron, we also see the Captain America villain Baron Zemo. And I'm pretty sure this guy is a more comic accurate Eric Killmonger. After all, Black Panther did briefly appear here in the original series. Now, as we speed run through Bastion's origin, I think it's interesting that he ends up seeing mutants and humans as separate entities, because Bastion is essentially the combination of Master Mold and Nimrod into a new being. And at the end of season one, Master Mold makes it clear he sees no distinction between these two races. Mutants are human. After being raised by human beings, Bastion comes to see the value of human life, and this is also similar to Nicholas Hunter in the comics. When Nimrod takes over that man's life, he begins to value doing everyday human things. But I love how all of this is coming full circle. Remember, Master Mold's plan in the end of season one of the show was to replace humanity with machines. You will remove Senator Kelly's brain and replace it with a computer. My sentinels are bringing me leaders from all over the world. In time, all of their brains will be replaced. And this is what Bastion is doing, evolving humanity by turning them into mindless drones. He says, Builders lay off a dozen workers and hire one mutant with the strength of ten men. Which is actually something we saw in the season one episode, The Unstoppable Juggernaut, when Colossus was hired to demolish a building. His name is Mutant Scab, and that's our money! So Bastion is taking advantage of blue-collar resentment, mass bigotry, and the ever-pervasive fear of authority figures that they're going to lose power, and he's taking all of that and using it as a way to seize power for himself. I see no real-life parallels here, do you, Doug? Nope, leave me out of this. So, then Rose transforms into one of these machines. At the same time, Roberto is having a conflict with his mother, where she refuses to accept him. Now, I thought this was a neat parallel to show us these two mothers with different levels of bigotry. Rose is consumed by this machine-like hate, while Roberto's mother is more of a soft bigot. She doesn't want to get involved and trusts authorities to handle the mutant problem. And then Trish Tilby, beast love interest from the comics, changes into a prime sentinel, and even Morph changing into the juggernaut cannot stop her. Outside the mansion, we see protesters, just like in the famous Grant Morrison arc, riot at Xavier's. And then, just like in the Zero Tolerance comic books, the prime sentinels overrun the mansion. We see this painting of Xavier as an explorer, wearing the same clothes that he wore in Kenya when he met Storm as a pickpocket. Wolverine calls her, Tin Woman. And remember, this is similar to the insult he first threw at a sentinel back in the first two episodes. Hey, Tin Woodsman, I'm sending you back to Oz. And dude, how creepy is this shot of the sentinels watching Rogue sleep? It's like paranormal activity. And then we get to see Nightcrawler finally using his fencing skills, but of course, blades don't really hurt Nimrod, so it's a losing battle. But then we do get to see the first person perspective of Nightcrawler's teleportation, which was awesome. Now notice when this happens, we see Wolverine kind of stretch as a way to show that by teleporting, Nightcrawler is actually bending space-time, which is different from the comics where he essentially moves himself across the magnetic waves of the Earth. Jubilee changes into a skin-tight black suit, similar to the prison uniform she wore in the Zero Tolerance comics when she was Bastion's prisoner. And we finally get to see Roberto, aka Sunspot, use his powers. Now in the comics, he was a founding member of the New Mutants, Xavier's second class of students that he brought in when he thought the X-Men were dead. And I kind of think that this season will end with Xavier reopening his school as a haven for all the Genosian survivors. And we're going to see more young mutants in season two. This could adapt those excellent Grant Morrison and Frank Quietly comics that I mentioned earlier. When the Prime Sentinels take down the Blackbird, Scott says, Not doing this again. And then Gene says that's the third Blackbird he's lost in the past few months. Where were the other two? Well, one of them was in episode one this season, but the other one was in the final episode of the original series. When Magneto destroyed the Blackbird, over Genosha. The license plate of Scott's Porsche reads Slim because that was his original nickname in the comics before Jim Lee started drawing him at the size of a bodybuilder. And I just love how much of a damn dad Scott is. Let's show these toasters why you don't screw with the Summers. The Simpsons are going to Genosha. Just as Scott's family is coming together, Roberto's is falling apart. The Prime Sentinels out him to the world and his mother trusts in the authorities to take care of it. We do not kill mutants. We save them. Do what the men say. Now this is hard breaking because it shows how fascists like Joseph Mengele rise to power. They take control and then people follow along with their agenda because someone in authority is telling them that it's the right thing to do. Like Bastion's mom, she has been consumed by a machine. And then Bastion comes to the 
X Mansion, just like in the Zero Tolerance comic book. Now, in the comic, he was trying to unlock the Xavier Protocols, the professor's secret plan to defeat the X Men if they ever went rogue. But I'm guessing here, he's looking for Cerebro so he can track down every mutant on Earth and eradicate them. But then we learn that Val Cooper's had a face turn after looking at Magneto's Holocaust tattoo. She frees him and he travels to the North Pole, the place where the Earth's electromagnetic waves converge. This is where he is at his strongest. And then, he sends an electromagnetic pulse to disable all of the world's electronics. Enough. And this is also similar to something that happens in the comics. After Cassandra Nova destroyed Genosha, Magneto was presumed dead. But a few issues later, he returned. I won't say how, but it's an amazing story. And he returned with a plan to reverse the polarity of the Earth. So then we see these events ripple outward across the Marvel Universe. First, we see Spider-Man, who crossed over with the X-Men in an excellent three-parter in his own original series. I help them accept who and what they are. Accept it? but I don't want to be a freak. And then we see the Silver Samurai who appeared in the episode Lotus and the Steel. And then we see the incredibly badass, dangerous super soldier Omega Red. And it's implied that the blackout is freeing him from his cell. A super soldier cell, which by the way, is similar to the holding tubes that we saw super soldiers in in Captain America's Civil War. And finally, just as Magneto declares war, the professor shows up in the same space suit Lilandra wore when she first contacted him. And then he says his catchphrase, summoning everyone together. To me, my X-Men. Oh God, this line is such a classic, and it's even the final line of the very first X-Men comic. And the most heartbreaking part of this episode was Val Cooper's final speech when she admits that Magneto was right, but her words have a lot of real world resonance. In Genosha, I felt a lot of things, pain, grief, but you know what the oddest thing was? No one seemed shocked or surprised. I mean, that's what's happening to us. We hear about another war, another shooting, another atrocity, and we allow ourselves to become numb to the idea of atrocities. Bo DeMaio said that the tragedy of Genosha was inspired by the shooting at the Pulse nightclub, which he frequented. And that gives every death in this season a harrowing real world parallel. To that point, Rose calls Operation Zero her son's final dream, a rewording of Hitler's final solution, the Holocaust, and a callback to the season one finale, the final decision. This season has focused on the roots of genocide. We see how first people are afraid and then kind of numb and then finally apathetic and then they cede moral authority to immoral leaders. Unlike the original series, this show is able to connect these fictional events to our real world and it challenges us to think, what could I do better? How could I help? How could I be a more tolerant and loving person? I I really love this show. So what do you guys think? Is Magneto now truly a villain? Do you think him and Xavier can work together? How are the X-Men gonna get out of this? What's Magneto's plan? Hey, I just wanna say thanks for the keeps. I got to keep my hair, ah! That's great, man. I'd high five you, but you're just a hand. And remember guys, to stop your hair loss today, click our link in the description for a special offer from Keeps. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.